Have you ever heard from God and you knew that it was His voice, but you didn't know what to do with it? We believe in a God who speaks and He listens, a God who is interested in conversation with all of us. How do we even know what His voice sounds like? How can we be sure that it's the Lord? You know, His voice is all around us, what He is saying, and how do we break through all the static to hear Him? of the days of thunder and today I'm going to talk about how we can discover the ways that we can cultivate a listening lifestyle in this fast pace of a race that all of us are in. Church will you join me in welcoming the whole planet earth to big time open door church y'all. This is the open door experience. Bye. Hello, my friends all over the world in various networks. I call you guys blessed and say welcome to Texas. Everybody say welcome to Texas. Welcome right on, right on. Hey, listen, I'd like to invite all y'all out all, for all over the planet Earth. It's, it's easy to get here. Our borders are open. Hallelujah. <laughs> we will have a chair waiting on you, and we will love on you, and we will bless you. Hallelujah. It's so good to see everybody here today. Guys, the person I'm about to introduce is a respected apostle, and she's also a wildly prophetic minister. She's somebody who has ministered to me through the years. Leanna and I watched her for years and years and years, not knowing that we would ever have a chance to meet her, but feeling like she was our friend before we ever even knew her. And it turns out, indeed, she was our friend. From the moment that we first met her, she was poured into Leanna and I's life in a powerful way. Um, I think probably one of the greatest examples of of a mama in the church is this amazing lady. And what I mean is, I mean, you know, as her name is, so, so is she. She kind of has a royalty about her that is so amazing. Um, she recently had a big time birthday party and she invited us and there were some of the most amazing people on the planet Earth. I actually sit next to Dog the Bounty Hunter at her birthday party. <laughs> it's like, I know they paired us up together. I know they did. It's like, wow. Guys, um, she's, a, she's committed to loving God and, and committed to giving a language to things that are otherwise hard and difficult, and she just makes it so simple and applicable. When I hear her speak or when I'm in the same room with her, I want to love Jesus more and more and more. And guys, she's here with us today. Open Door Church, let's give a great big welcome to Miss Patricia King. This is a wonderful day to be in love with Jesus, wouldn't you say? It's amazing, it's wonderful to be here and I brag on you guys everywhere I go. You're an amazing um, family of believers that give so much life to your region and, and so much good testimony sent out so that people can hear how great Jesus is. Way to go. We love your pastors and uh, we love this house and we do believe that we have friendship amongst us that is beautiful. I have a message for you this morning that I've been mandated by the Lord uh, to carry and so I'm I'm releasing it into the spirit, believing for great ripple effects to take place in the nation. But God is looking for those who he can entrust with a great call to perfect love. And as a congregation, you model this so well already. He has his eye on you, and I believe that revival can, can be released through just what you are doing here. And so we are going to believe God today to just put more uh, uh, fuel on the fire, so to speak, so that you can be even stronger than you've ever been before. But Jesus gave us one mandate. He said, there's only one commandment you really have to um, stand on and obey, and that is the commandment to love. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so these these um, words of Jesus Christ should be the very center of our walk with him. Everything that we do and say should be founded and grounded in those words. He just makes it so easy. He didn't give us a thousand commandments to obey, just one, you know? And so if we can focus on that, we'll see God do great things in and through us. And so also we see Paul saying that, in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if you do not have love, you have nothing, you are nothing, and a prophet's nothing. So you can have faith to move mountains, you can give all your money to feed the poor, you can, you can uh, prophesy accurately, you can preach up a storm, you can sing a great song, but without love, you have nothing. Without love, you are nothing. Without love, it profits nothing. And so our lives can be a whole bunch of nothing if we don't get aligned with God's love, and God is love. And it says that if we know God, we will love love because he is love. He will fill us with his love. And so this needs to be our greatest aim. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, he said, let love be your greatest aim and desire earnestly to prophesy. You know, you want to, you know, utilize the gifts and all the good things of the kingdom, but before anything, be committed to love. I believe that as a nation in particular, and the church specifically in the nation, is in a crisis, a love crisis. And if you think back to 2020, we had an era transition. We transitioned from one era into a new era. And we got hit in 2020 with this onslaught of demonic activity, amen? A virus hit the whole globe, and, and with it came also an onslaught of the spirit of fear. And the spirit of fear just infected people's lives in a huge way. And people who had been great believers before that were all of a sudden trembling at the works of the enemy and wondering how their future was going to work out. The devil had a strategy, and it was to cause us to tremble before the different things that were happening. But the greater the the, the greater weapon that the enemy used in 2020 was to bring forth an onslaught of offense. Offense ran rampant in 2020. With the virus coming in and, and all that was happening there, you know, there was all kinds of, of uh, rules that were put in place for it. Um, there was social distancing. Schools were shut down. Uh, people were told that they had to wear masks. Um, there was, you know, all kinds of things around that. And with it came offense. Some were offended because they had to wear masks. Some were offended at those who were wearing masks. There was offense everywhere. There was offense about the vaccines, whether you should get a vaccine or not. And the ones that got vaccines, they had people offended with them. And the ones who didn't get vaccines also had people offended with them. Even within families, there was division in family because of offense over a vaccine. We ourselves in our own family had an issue where um, a relative told us that if we wouldn't get vaccinated, um, they would never visit us again. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know? And honestly, I have to be honest about this, I got offended with them being offended in that way towards us. You know how this works, right? So offense is a killer, and when you are offended, you are not walking in love. And when you're walking in love, you are not offended. And so the Lord uh, drew to my attention this whole uh, mandate that he wanted me to carry on offense by confronting me with it last December. And he said, I want you to live an unoffendable life. And I thought, yay, yeah, that's awesome. I want love to be my greatest aim. I want to learn how to love, and I don't want to live offendable. Awesome. And I said, this is going to be easy, I think, because I don't think I'm that offendable a person. And he says, yeah, until you're not. 
And I didn't think I was easily offended until it started being drawn to my attention. And then every single day, I was getting convicted of being offended on so many different things. And after this message, you are going to feel the same. You're going to say, whoa, offense is on my radar. But I'll never forget right after he told me that, I was, I was driving down the highway, and I was in the fast lane, and you all know what the fast lane represents. You have to be doing at least the speed limit in that lane. You're not allowed to go under the speed limit in the fast lane. You can sneak up a little bit more, a little bit more, but you are not allowed to do less in the fast lane. That's not what it's meant for. So I was in the fast lane, And there was a car in front of me who did not understand the rules of the road and how to use a fast lane. And he was just, you know, I think he was on the phone actually, but he was just, you know, doing his thing. And he was going slow. And I thought, well, maybe I can pass him on the other side. But there was all these other cars there and they were really going slow, a whole lane of them. And I couldn't go over there and then get back around this guy. So I thought I'd give him some kind suggestion. And I said, sir, move into the other lane, as if he could hear me. Move into the other lane. You're not going fast enough. Get over there. He didn't hear me. He didn't listen. He didn't obey. And so I got a little bit stronger. And then all of a sudden, I found myself yelling at him. I was calling him an idiot, even. You idiot. You're supposed to be in the slow lane. (laughs) And then the Holy Spirit said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. (laughs) Well, that was just the beginning. I I had no idea how offended I was. In fact, I would even be watching a television program, and I'd be watching a guy behaving in a certain way on the television program, and all of a sudden, offense would come out of my mouth. Get away from me, you jerk. You know, we shouldn't be doing that. And, And the Lord says, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And I realized it was a natural trigger. I would have never wanted to admit it, but it was triggered all the time. I thought, oh my goodness, I had no idea. He says, well, I did. (laughs) And the problem with offense is when you're walking in it, it blocks love. In fact, it is an actual sin that inside of the one sin of offense, there are five other sins. So every time you sin one sin of offense, you've actually transgressed in five areas. And you know every sin bears a consequence. So if you are an offense, you have five consequences for every offense. I don't know about you, but I don't want that in my life. I prefer, you know, like love consequences because there's consequences to walking in love as well. So let's take a look at a few scriptures that you might enjoy. Proverbs 24, 19. It says, Do not, don't be angrily offended over evildoers or be agitated by them. Now, sometimes we feel self-justified in being offended because the people we're offended with are just off. They're, they're evil. Some of you have, you know, marked certain politicians saying, They are just evil. They're wicked. You know, I'm offended with them. And you'll say all kinds of things about them, but it says don't be angrily offended over evildoers. Even if they are doing evil, you're not allowed to be offended with them. Woo-hoo. You can maybe be offended with the values that they're violating or whatever, but you're not allowed to be offended with them. It's a big one in the United States right now. Don't be angrily offended over evildoers or be agitated by them. Woohoo! Now, the Bible says that if you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. So if you regard the iniquity of offense with its five transgressions in your heart, guess what? You could be praying for the politician you want to come in or for the agenda you want to come in, but the Lord says, sorry, can't hear. Because your prayer is fueled with offense. Your prayer is motivated by offense. 
And maybe one of the reasons why the church, the ecclesia, has not been able to release the authority that we have in the Lord is because there's too much offense within the church. And a lot of our agendas that we are trying to build for the kingdom are not kingdom at all. They're just man's anger and offense. Just saying. I'm leaving town in a few hours. <laughs> I believe that if we can clear the slate here, we're going to see the power of God manifest because everyone that we might be angrily offended with, whether it's a politician, a family member, a, a school teacher, a, a boss, whatever, a friend, whatever, it's like if they are doing evil, they are being deceived. It says in Hebrews that, that sin is deceitful. It's the deceitfulness of sin. So they're in it and they need to be rescued from it, not condemned, not put down, not dishonored, but saved and rescued and delivered. And we oftentimes want others that we don't care about or that we are offended with to be treated differently than ourselves. And sometimes we have even bigger stuff going on in our own life, maybe in a different area, but it's still there. But we want, you know, terrible things to happen to this person over here that we're offended with, but we want to be okay. And we think that God will look upon us differently. Proverbs 12, 16. Let's just take another scripture. If you shrug off an insult and refuse to take offense, you demonstrate wisdom and discretion indeed. Wisdom is first pure, it's peaceable, it's easily entreated, it yields the fruit of righteousness, right? So if you refuse to take offense, you demonstrate wisdom and discretion indeed. But the fool, everyone say the fool, has a short fuse and will immediately let you know when he's offended. Selah. Some things just don't need to be preached. Psalm 119, 165, there is such a great peace and well-being that comes to the lovers of your word, and they will never be offended. It is actually possible to live a life without offense. If we love the Lord, if we love the word, he's going to give us the power to speak the truth boldly in love, to even be confrontational, but without being fueled by offense. I was listening to a preacher preach a little while ago, and they had such a, a, a good message to preach, but... They were preaching it with a motive of offense. That was what was fueling them, and it was passing on to everyone who was listening the offense, the dishonor, the anger, the bitterness that was inside of it was, was, was spreading. People were giving their amens to it, and it was so sad. I thought, this message did not need to be preached like that. This message could have promoted the truth, put a strong uh, standard in the ground, but still show love. But you see, when we're offended, I'm speaking about myself. You need to know that I'm growing in this. I've not arrived. But I want the Lord to help me through my issues of offense. When they rise up, when I can identify them, I said, Lord, just nail me on it because all of us could be in the same boat where we make decisions in life, where we proclaim messages or even prophesy with offense in our heart and it turns out to be used by the devil instead of by God. You see, if you put poison into a cup, the whole cup of water is poisoned. It's not an ounce of pure water in there anymore. So when you deliver something with offense in it, the water is poisoned. I'm just, these are just lessons I'm learning, so I'm passing them on. Many actually thrive on being offended because it makes them feel more powerful. It makes you feel more powerful if you're offended. But it, it, it doesn't bring about um, justice. It doesn't bring about a right result. Sometimes we feel um, our offense is justifiable if there's a justice issue at hand. When I first went into Bangkok, I was sitting beside a table in a restaurant the very first night I arrived. 
with a man, a Western man who is in his mid-50s, who is sitting there with a young girl, looked about 15 years old, who had dressed provocatively, and you could tell exactly what was happening. I knew what was happening. He had rented her from a brothel for the night or for the weekend, and I wanted to give him some five-fold ministry at that moment <laughs> because I was offended, offended, and rightfully so, Right? Because he shouldn't be treating that girl like that. He shouldn't be damaging the life like that. So I had all these justifiable issues in my mind. I wanted to just grab the girl and take her back to our hotel. And I was trying to work out how we were going to do that when the Lord nailed me. He said, Patricia, that man had some things happen in his childhood. This is what happened with him. He is, is searching for love. He is searching for value. And he, and he came here deceived, thinking he would find it in the brothels. He said, but he's been deceived and he won't find it. And the devil's trying to keep him hurt. He hurt him as a child. He's hurt him as an adult. He's hurt him now because he is believing a lie. And all of a sudden, I started getting compassion for the man. I was emotionally conflicted, confused. Now I didn't know what to do with my fivefold ministry. <laughs> and I won't go into all the details, but over, over the next couple of days, as we saw all kinds of atrocious behaviors and things like that, God taught me how to rightly divide between the sinner and the sin. The one who's been afflicted by the deceptions of the enemy and everything that's gone on in their life prior to that, and of course, the actual sin. It says in Romans 1 that, that, that God's wrath is directed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. It didn't, doesn't say it's directed towards people. And so we need to be like him. So there was issues in the whole trafficking thing, the brothel issues, sex tourism, all of that that needed to be addressed, but we wouldn't be able to be effective in that if we didn't get this right. So once we got ourselves right and laid down the offense, we were able to do so much good, rescue many people from that kind of, uh, of uh, trappings, um, bring things to the government, have national policy changes, all of those things we were able to implement with love, speaking the truth with boldness, uncompromised, unwavering truth, but not offended with any individual. We were being spokespeople for God, and God needs his spokespeople now to be unhindered by offenses because there's many things we need to address. There are issues we need to address. Our children are being poisoned by the enemy in all kinds of ways with different laws being passed and that, and that is an injustice, but it's not the people that we need to go after. We need to fight this in the spirit, and we need to speak the truth in love to the right people at the right time, whether they listen or not, we need to speak the truth in love. Now, the five offenses that we find in, in, um, in or, or, or the five transgressions we find in offense are number one, anger. Every offense, every time you're offended, there is an element of anger in it. It might be from slightly miffed to a full-on rage, but there is anger involved with offense. It triggers you, and anger triggers you. And it says in uh, James 1, verse 20, it says that the anger of man will not achieve the righteousness of God. And so that's a good lesson. We need to identify this, that our anger is not going to achieve anything good. We need to go to God and find out how to address the issue. Paul taught us to be angry or indignant, but not to sin. And in the Amplified Version, it says this, be angry at sin, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Be angry, be angry, be angry at sin. Not at the people, at sin, at immorality, at injustice, at ungodly behavior, yet do not sin. Do not let your anger cause you shame, nor allow it to last until the sun goes down, and do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge, or nurturing anger, or harboring resentment, or cultivating bitterness. 
So you can see how you can rightly divide it. You can have a strong stand of truth and address it, but you do it in love and you, you don't uh, place your anger against a human being. Jesus didn't. On the cross, he could have been offended with all of us. We had every right to, but every drop of blood he shed was unoffendable. A lot of times people will say, well, Jesus got angry. Look what he did, well, driving the money changers out of the te temple. Well, we imagine it like that, but sometimes we add our own emotion into the scriptures and it doesn't actually say it like that. And if you actually look up the Greek words, like where it says cast out, there is a passive usage of that word that actually means direct out, direct a person out. And so what if that's what Jesus did? And instead of overthrow, one of the passive usages of that word that was used in the Greek is to turn over. And many, many versions use now that turn over rather than overthrow. Overthrowing connotates violence, but turning the table over is just a truthful act that is going to say closed for business, right? And leading them out is saying, you're not, you're not allowed to do this in here anymore. But you can do that without being offended. You can do that just as a matter of truth, not with any anger inside of it. And then he said, my father's house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. He's speaking the truth. He's just black and white speaking the truth, and that's great, but you can do that without anger. The next one is bitterness. Bitterness. In Hebrews 12, 15, it says that, that um, bitter roots defile many. There's a defiling connection to bitterness. Why? Because with offense, you do not keep offense to yourself. You share it. In fact, you want everyone to agree with you. You want everyone to be on your side, so you'll go tell the world. And actually, I've seen oftentimes um, when it's shared, there's embellishment that is added to the original offense that will convince the other person how much that they should be on the same page with you. So now you've even added another offense, which is lying. Embellishment is that, lying, exaggerating. So when someone comes to you and they're all offended with someone because someone's hurt them, Listen to them, of course, and look for a way that you can bring them to the cross, to healing, to forgiveness, to lay down their own offense. Be used of God to do that. But if you're sitting there and you're taking up their offense and coming into agreement with them, you're going to find yourself in a great sin with five transgressions. And your heart will become bitter towards the person that they've been talking to you about. And that could even be a public figure. That could be a public figure. When you see on the news a person did a wrong thing, maybe murdered someone or something, you know, and you get the report or, or you know, a big business leader was, was embezzling funds and ripping people off or whatever, you can get offended by watching that report, but you don't know the whole story. And how often we, do we go to offense over something like that instead of to intercession for that person? How often do we... Do we make the choice to just get bitter over it and to add it? And God doesn't want us to be bitter. And when I'm talking about bitterness, I'm talking about the difference between sweet and bitter, right? So like when I knew I was coming here this morning, I could hardly wait because when I think of Troy and Leanna and the family here, I, I, I just have positive thoughts in my mind. I have a smile on my heart when I think of it, right? That's sweet. But if you're thinking of a person and you have a negative thought, and you think, oh, I don't know if I want to see them. Oh, I don't even want to hear about them. That's bitter. Sweet or bitter. Very seldom are we ever neutral. It's usually one or the other. I shared, um, I shared an example of a, of a married couple because many marriages are in divorce courts now because of offense. Started with offense. And so this married couple, they really love each other, they care about each other, they can hardly wait to get married, they're just like, you are the one I want to spend the rest of my life with, I want to grow old with you, there's no one else, I'm just smitten by love. And so the bride's walking down the aisle, the groom is at the front of the church saying, oh, I can hardly wait to seal the deal. 
And then they go on this beautiful honeymoon and everything's like, woo, so wonderful. And they get back home and he is a very orderly person. He likes order, he likes structure. So in his closet, he has all the colors all coated of his clothing and all the creases on his shirts are all in the same direction. His shoes are all lined up, but she's more creative. And so her, th her clothes are just thrown out there. And, and there's, you know, a few issues that are concerning to him. So one of them was she squeezes her toothpaste in the middle of the tube. And he says, no, 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 no. That is not the way you, you squeeze the toothpaste. <clears throat> we have to do it this way. And he taught her how to do it. But in her creative moments while she was brushing the teeth, she forgot to do it from the bottom. And so there was issues. He was offended with her because of the toothpaste issue. Well, then she thought that that was kind of you know, unfair. So she got offended with him for being offended with her. And then it got worse because he liked in the fridge the vegetables to be in one bin and the, and, and the fruit in the other, but she couldn't tell whether a tomato was a fruit or a vegetable, so she put it in the wrong bin, and that became an issue too. And with her creative mind, the way she cooked, there was stuff all over the place when she cooked, whereas he liked to put everything away after you know, after it was finished. So, I mean, these little things started little offenses that got into bigger offenses and bigger offenses and bigger offenses. And 10 years later, they are so distant from one another, they have no woo-hoo anymore. <laughs> They're just like, yeah, -huh, you know? And they've got this wall between them and they had to end up going to a marriage counselor to help sort it out. And it took forever to sort it out, to offer forgiveness, to come into humility, to be committed to love again. It took forever. And it started with toothpaste and tobacco. You know, it's just like, it doesn't make any sense, does it? But that is the danger of offense. That is the danger of it. And it just keeps growing. If you don't deal with it, it grows. And God wants you to deal with it today. The third one is judgment. The scripture says, Matthew 7, 1 and 2 says, do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the way that you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Amen? So when you're offended with someone, you're actually judging them. You might not think you are, but you can't be offended without judgment in your heart. You know, it's impossible. Okay? So... So God wants you to be free from offense so that you can be free from judgment because if you're judging another person, it's going to come back on you, but you'll get more than what you gave out. And you'll be judged by the exact same measure. I want to just share an example of the woman caught in adultery. The Pharisees were offended with Jesus' teaching, right? They were offended with him. So they want to catch him in the act, you know, of of just teaching wrong, wrong doctrine or misinterpreting the scriptures. So they grab a woman who was caught in adultery and they were offended with her as well. So they're offended with him, offended with her, and they have stones in their hands, absolutely convinced that they have a right to judge, judge this situation and judge the woman. So they try to trap Jesus in saying, okay, the law says that if you catch a woman in the act of adultery, you stone her to death. What sayeth thou? He didn't say anything. He just stooped down on the ground, wrote something there. I don't know what or why, but he was down there. And when he got up, he was so brilliant. He said, if you are without sin, you throw the first stone. What was so brilliant about this is he didn't condemn the Pharisees or anything. He didn't judge them wrongly or meanly or cruelly or anything like that. He just said, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. Well, they all dropped their stones. Why? Because he exposed their sin without condemning or judging them. He just, he just up, up, upheld the truth. And they very quietly dropped their stones and went away. And then he turns to the woman and says, um, you know, where, where are those who condemn you? Where are those who judge you? And she says, well, they're gone. There's no one left. He said, well, I don't either. But he could have. He was the only one that was without sin. He could have thrown a stone and he didn't. He could have lambasted those Pharisees, but he didn't. He just wanted them to know the freedom from, from where they were standing. 
And so he addressed both issues. When he sent the woman off, he said, go and sin no more. So he upheld the truth. He didn't compromise truth. He upheld the truth, but without offense. The fourth one is unforgiveness. In Matthew 18, 21 to 20, or 35, it teaches that we are not to hold on to unforgiveness in any way because we've been forgiven of so much. So if someone does something wrong to us, it doesn't even compare with every single sin that you've sinned your whole life against God and others. No comparison. Your sins are way more than what someone's done to offend you, okay, or to warrant your offense. And so you are to forgive others, to release them. Let God deal with them if need be. And don't say, well, I forgive, but I don't trust. You might need to wait to trust a person. And you might even need some boundaries. But if you have that kind of attitude that I just acted out in your heart, it's not real forgiveness. You're just covering it up. You're covering it up with a word called forgiveness, but it's not really forgiveness. So you need to say, God, is it a loving thing for me to put a boundary around that person, not to trust them in a certain situation because that wouldn't be the best for them or the best for others. And that's what love does. So it's good to set the boundaries and to look on that trust issue, but not if it's got offense driving it. And then the fifth is pride. I'm sorry I can't unpack these more for you, but you can get my book. It's coming out next month. Pride. Pride comes before the fall. Proverbs 16, 18. It comes before the fall, and every time you're in offense, you are in pride. You are condescending upon someone. When I was in the car yelling at the driver in front of me, I was in a seat of judgment against him. I was risen up above him, better than him. I'm going to tell you where it's at. You need to be over here. I'm the one that's, you know. And so you're putting yourself in a condescending position. So when you are offended, there are these five transgressions that go into operation in every offense. And every sin bears a consequence. That's a lot of consequences if we don't make it right. And we want to be a powerful church who operates in love where all of our prayers get answered where everything we speak has weight, where the authority of Jesus goes out. In uh, Revelation chapter 12, I believe it's verse 10, it says salvation and power, dunamis power, the kingdom of God and um, the authority of our Christ has come because the, the accusation has been cast down because accusation has been cast down. And so one of the reasons why we don't see more salvation, more authority, more dunamis miracle working power, more um, of, of, of Jesus' kingdom being manifest is because we haven't cast it down in our own hearts. And God wants that to happen today. There are families who are gonna be mended today because offense is gonna be cast down, marriage is healed, bodies healed, even physical bodies can suffer from offense. The bitterness of it can affect bodies. But today, God is in the house, and he's looking for a people who will take a stand for him and say, I'll be unoffendable. And you know, I used to, when, when he first spoke to me about this, many times during a day, I'd be convicted of offense. But now, it's, you know, I can go whole days without being convicted. And I'm hoping I'll come to a place where I'll never be offended. I'm not there yet, but it's my goal. It's my greatest aim is to learn to love. And we can start today, today, receiving a clean slate from the Lord. We just ask him to forgive us, and he will, and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess offense. And then we have a clean slate. We can start fresh and let him build a life without offense. Can you imagine what the church is going to look like in this nation without offense? Only love, speaking the truth in love, being a powerful body that exercises the authority of Christ and seeing things shift. But this has to be taken care of. Folks, there's too much out there. You can just go on social media and see it. Slander and hatred and offense everywhere but it doesn't help any of the issues. 
It doesn't change anything. It just weakens the church even more. And God says, church, deal with this. Deal with this one. Deal with this in your personal lives or you'll grow grumpy and old. God will still love you. We'll all still love you. But man, will you be a grump? You'll be hard to live with. You'll be someone else's grace grower. But if you want to deal with offense today, I'd like you to stand, please. If you want to say in your heart, God, I don't want one bit of offense in my life. I want to take a stand today to live unoffendable. You just stand to your feet in the presence of the Lord and say, here I am. I want to live unoffendable. And he sees you standing. He sees you standing, and Father, I pray. I pray for everyone in the house, everyone who's standing right now, that you would free them from offense, that they would be able to lay it down, that they would repent from any of their anger, their bitterness, their, their judgment, their unforgiveness, their pride. Lord, that they would be pierced through with a beautiful love conviction of the Holy Spirit so that they can drip more of your love to those around them. Just come and fill them afresh with your beautiful love, washing all the offense away. Jesus could have been offended with us all on the cross, but he wasn't offended, not for a moment. He laid his life down for each and every one of you. And he is going to teach you to be just like him. Now we're going to close the service today by inviting you to come forward. If there's any specific area of offense that you want to deal with at the altar. There's something beautiful about coming to the altar and meeting with God. We want to help you. We want to break it off. We want to cut it off. And even if someone's been offended with you and you know about it, we want to break that off of you, the influence of it. You can forgive them and have it cut off of you today. I believe that as you come forward, um, there's going to be healings healings of relationship, healings of, of, of body conditions, physical conditions, emotional health issues, insomnia healed. I just believe there's going to be so much touch of the Lord here at the altars today. So come forward now. If you want to come forth specifically for something, come on forward. Don't be afraid to just slip out of your seats and come forward. And let's, let's bring this to God today. He is here to heal. He is here to bring love into your life such as you've never known, such as you've never known. Come on forward to him, to Jesus Christ, the lover of all, who is completely unoffendable. We can be just like him.